Thanks, Tom. Well, that was powerful singing this morning. What a delight. I thought you guys were going to shatter the windows in the church building. We'd have to have another work day to clean all that up and replace them. So that would, hopefully we could do that someday. But very powerful. And it's a delight to return to the Word this morning. I hope you're ready to open your Bibles. That's what we do here. We open the Bible and we find what God has to say in the text of Scripture. And that is uh, God's will for us. And so we return to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. And it says, And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So maybe to the surprise of us all, we return to the very next verse at Ephesians. It's only taken, I don't know, three months, four months to get to the next verse. Now, Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, for that is, I memorized it originally in the New American, that is a disp- dissipation, uh, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, that verse, verse 18, was my very first seminary assignment in class, was to take Ephesians 5.18, and we had to make 25 observations on verse 18 alone. Uh, and we could not make observations about the context. It was only verse 18, and I'll never forget that. Uh, It's one of those times where you get the first 10 fairly easily, and then it becomes more challenging as you continue to try to find observations on the verse. Uh, My goal was to pull things out of the text, not to pull things out of my ear in class. I probably had a few that were great observations, but uh, it's a good challenge. Maybe try it yourself with a verse, or try it with this verse. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, ESV, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, for me, it was a helpful journey in this whole subject of hermeneutics. Uh, I think our professor was trying to get us to hone in our observational skills of Scripture, uh, to, to get us to think about details, to observe the text of Scripture better than we had. And it was a challenge, and he challenged us the rest of the class Uh, He was into details. You had to have your name and your box number in the upper right-hand corner with the date, and it had to be a certain format and font and spacing. And, I mean, we tried. We tried to change the spacing in our papers. He would always catch that, right? He knew. And he was doing, what he was doing is having us give attention to details, which was not my strength. And I want you to give yourself to the Scripture in the same way. Give yourself to the details of Scripture. Uh, There is so much in the Word of God to find. There's so much gold to mine from the Word as we look at. And this verse, verse 18, is rich with truth. Uh, And its context, as we're going to see in the next few verses here, it's a powerful verse on what it means, what it looks like, and the effects of being filled with the Spirit And so earlier in chapter 5, if you remember that we are called God's children, uh, even the Apostle Paul began Ephesians chapter 1 by addressing us as adopted. We are adopted children in Christ. And now in chapter 5, verse 1, we are to be imitators of God as God's beloved children. And we've looked at what we're supposed to do as his children. Right? Verse 2, we're supposed to walk in love. Verse 8, we are to walk in light. And in verse 15, we are to walk in wisdom as God's children. Our lives are entirely different now. Uh, We are not only saved, but there's many more things that happen to us when we are uh, unified with Christ. One of those is we are adopted. We are children of God. We are now brothers and sisters of a new family. And our life is going to look different, or it should. It should be characterized by things such as love and light or holiness and wisdom, as Paul tells us here. But the question remains, how can we do all of this? Uh, One might be burdened by, starting in chapter 4, all of the commands that the apostle has given us. I don't know if you've felt that way so far in Ephesians. Command after command after command that maybe you begin to feel the weight of the commands of Scripture here. We might feel that way. We might feel weak because we are weak. 
We are weak, we are feeble, we are frail, we are imperfect, and we are uh, easily burdened. Even the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3, said, I came to you, Corinthians, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And that's an apostle. That's uh, the great apostle Paul came in weakness and he came in fear. And maybe we feel that way and maybe that's a good thing that we feel that way. But we might feel easily crushed under all of these commands, feeling that deep inability to do what the Lord has clearly revealed for us to do. We know that we have new life in Christ. We are regenerated, chapter 2. We were by nature children of wrath, but Paul's clear there that God has given us new life in Christ. The old things are gone, the new have come. We are now new, a new creation. He's also clearly given us directions in how to live out this new life in light of the grace of God. But how do we do this? When it comes down to it, what is the enabling power by which we live the Christian life? What is the, the enabling power to do the commands that God has given us, to carry them out in our life? And Paul provides the answer here, doesn't he? Be filled with the Spirit. But it's another command, isn't it? You are to be filled with the Spirit. Another duty for the Christian. And here we find, though, the enabling power to do so. Here we find that we're not alone in our life in Christ. I, I think we discover another put off, put on by Paul, his language, right? Put off the old man and put on the new man. Put away drunkenness and put on what? The filling of the Holy Spirit. And so we come to the subject of the Spirit of God. You know, I often say some people are extremely intrigued by the Spirit and probably talk so much about the Spirit they forget about the Father and the Son. There are circles like that. And then there are other circles, this is probably more our circle, that we're kind of afraid to talk about the Spirit. We're not really sure about Him. We know we're to pray to the Father and the Son. We're not sure if we can pray to the Spirit. And we're afraid maybe to focus too much on the Spirit. But friends, He focuses on the Spirit, so let us focus upon Him. He is God, very God. And He's mentioned the Spirit throughout His short letter. Remember there in chapter 1, he began by telling us that after the Father has chosen us for adoption and after the Son has redeemed us through his blood, remember Paul's Trinitarian uh, prayer, doxology there, he then goes to the Spirit, doesn't he? Remember chapter 1? It was months ago. <laughs> and he tells us there in verse 14, or 13 rather, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Going with John's theme here of being home. There's this guarantee we have that there's a future inheritance and we're waiting for that. That's part of our home. And what is the kind of down payment? What is the initial installment uh, guarantee that you will receive your future inheritance. It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? That's a pretty good gift, isn't it? God gave us God as a down payment before the rest of our inheritance. How blessed we are. We're marked here, it says in chapter 1, by the Spirit. We have the seal of the Spirit. The seal would then mark someone owning a particular property. And I believe Paul is saying here that you are marked by the Spirit, meaning you're owned by God and you're owned by God forever. No one can take you. You cannot be snatched out of the Father's hands, as, as Jesus says in John chapter 10. And the Spirit is the guarantee of that security. We are marked by Him. Every believer, by the way, Romans 8, 9, has the Spirit. There's no such thing as a believer who does not have the Holy Spirit. Every believer is given the Spirit. And the Spirit, according to Titus 3.5, is the agent of our regeneration. He is the one by which we are washed and renewed, and we are given new life. So the apostle prays for the Ephesians in chapter 1. 
a little bit later there, starting in verse 15. And he prays that through the Spirit, they may, they may better know the Father and that they also better understand the riches of the glory of their inheritance and that they better comprehend the greatness of the power of God. And I believe he means by that the Spirit of God that you have been blessed, you've been adopted, you've been purchased, you've been sealed. You also have a relationship with the Father. And Paul prays that you know him better and that you be strengthened by the Spirit. In chapter 2, after he discusses our previous state and then God saving us by his grace and giving us new life, he says that God is bringing together both Jew and Gentile into one new man by the Spirit there, that we become a dwelling place for God. Chapter 2, verse 22, by the Spirit. So not only are we marked and sealed by the Spirit, not only can we pray and receive help and strength through the Spirit, the Spirit is actually forming the church and unifying both Jew and Gentile. And in chapter 3, he mentions that the Spirit is the agent by which the apostles and the prophets spoke the word of God. And then what does Paul do at the end of chapter 3? He prays again. Paul's a praying man. And he prays that they be strengthened in their minds, in their hearts, that they might better comprehend, comprehend the love of Christ. And he relies upon the Spirit there to do so. This is all saturated by the Spirit. He's the one who helps us to comprehend the love of Christ. In chapter 4, he then provides the practical, the exhortations based out of the gospel. And one of the first things he says, chapter 4, verse 3, is that we be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Do you see the Spirit throughout his letter now? Maybe he's been hidden. Maybe you've seen him. He's working often behind the scenes. The Spirit doesn't take the front. He likes to glorify the Father. He likes to display and magnify the Son. But we should recognize him and we should worship him for he is God, very God. And Paul begins these exhortations, as I mentioned, one after another as he get, continues to tell us how to put off the old man and to put on the new man, we come to verse 30, and he again reintroduces the Spirit, and he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There's again that chapter 1, that future home, future inheritance language. There, there's something to come in the future, Christian. And meanwhile, you've been given the Spirit. He is your seal. He is your protection. He is your strength. Do not grieve him, Paul says, for he is with you to the very end. The Spirit is all these things. So we are to put off the old and to put on the new. We are to put off drunkenness and to put on the Spirit in our text, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is, what he says here, is reckless living, but instead be controlled by the Spirit. That's my translation. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is reckless living. Instead, be controlled or be influenced by the Spirit. We are to be under the influence, under the power of the Holy Spirit who was given to us at our birth. And so Paul begins to focus here on the how. How do we do all these commands? How are we sanctified? Who is our enabling agent? And it's the Spirit. Well, let me give you 25 observations. No, I will not do that. You'll be here all day. But I'll give you three. How's that? I wanted to observe the Spirit's presence, the Spirit's control, and the Spirit's power. The Spirit's presence, the Spirit's control, and the Spirit's power. Let's first look at the Spirit's presence. Not only are we regenerated, but we have God himself with us, the Spirit of God. Friends, this is 
an astounding truth. Do you realize that you as a believer have God with you? You know, I, I want, I, I'd love to transport those Old Testament believers here and just interview them. What do you think of that idea? The Spirit of God himself with a believer, within a believer? It's amazing. God no longer dwells in the temple. This would be amazing news, particularly for the Jew. God no longer dwells in that tabernacle made from human hands that's in the wilderness. He's no longer over there. He's no longer in the pillar of fire and the cloud, the Shekinah glory that's over there. Paul has already told us here that we have the Spirit. He is with us. He's within us. It's amazing truth that God's Spirit dwells within the believer, which should produce what in your life? I think probably what Paul says there in 1 Corinthians, right? That this fear, this trembling, right? Uh, it would be a scary thing when you read Exodus and it, and, and it says there to not approach, not to touch the mountain. To, you wouldn't go close to the mountain of God there. That would be a scary idea. It would be a terrifying idea. It was terrifying for Moses to come down from the mountain. They had to veil his face because the glory of God that was on him was too much. Uh, it wasn't so much about pleasure. It was about fear because we're sinners. And yet now we find he's no longer in the temple. He's no longer in the tabernacle. He is with the believer, meaning we are a kind of tabernacle in which the Spirit dwells within us. And this should affect us practically. This is exactly what Paul said earlier in verse 30 of chapter 4. Do not grieve the Spirit. There's a closeness, an intimacy that we have with God in Christ. We are not to grieve Him. We're not to go against His will. Uh, we are not to grieve the promised Spirit, who is the guarantee of our future inheritance. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's very interesting that Paul uses this truth with practical implications. In chapter 6, verse 18, he tells the Corinthians to flee from sexual immorality. He says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Interesting, the, the, the logic he begins with is, there are a lot of sins we commit that may not affect our body, but here's a sin actually that affects our body physically. But then what is the kind of impetus to the Christian life to purity? What is the, the great motivation to purity? Or do you not know, he says, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? And then he reminds them again, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. He reminds them of the gospel. That Christ saved you, saved you, that he purchased you, that he owns you now. Right? You're always a slave. We were talking about this earlier. Before you were a slave to Satan, chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air. You were a son of disobedience. Now in Christ, you're a slave of Christ. That's a really good master to serve. Here he owns you, and do you not know, Paul says, have you forgotten that the Spirit dwells within you? How you conduct your life, even on a physical level, matters because of the Spirit. Do you not know what you should know? Surely Paul had told them this before, that the Spirit dwells within them, and here's that great motive for purity. Not just simply earthly or physical consequences, but that the Spirit of God graciously and intimately dwells within you. What a great motivation. What a great motivation on every level in the Christian life. Just as he said back, if you go to Ephesians again, chapter 4, do not grieve the Spirit. He is a person. The Spirit is a person. How often have you thought about that truth? He is a person just like Jesus is a person. Do you think of the Holy Spirit this way? Do you think of him as a person who dwells with you and within you? Do you consider that as you go about your Christian life, that there's a person who's always with you? 
He will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus has promised. Well, we know that to be true too because he's also given us his spirit, which fulfills the fact that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, Paul has told us this. Meaning that he's not a, just a power. You, you can't grieve an energy force. You can't grieve just a substance of some kind. You can only grieve a person. Therefore, the Spirit of God is not simply a power or an energy. And this is not the idea of what Paul means when he says be filled with the Spirit. He's not saying that you have some of the Spirit and you need more of him. No, he's a person. You have all of him because he's a person. You either have the Spirit or you don't. And we know in Romans 8, verse 9, that every Christian has the Spirit. So this is not about getting more of him than you have. As I'm going to argue, it means being controlled and influenced by the Spirit. But he is a person, and we have all of him. The apostle never thinks of the Spirit as a kind of energy force that we tap into, kind of like plugging our phone into a charger or, or the, these Teslas that have to be plugged into some kind of electrical contraption and you hope the power doesn't go out from a storm. I was wondering that the other day. How are they going to function? I'm thankful for my old Corolla. It's going to keep going <laughs> no matter what. But we don't do that with the Spirit. He's not this kind of force we just kind of plug into, we're re-energized for the day. By the end of the day, we're worn out. We need more of the Spirit, or we need to have more of him than we already have. Rather, he is a person. We can please him. We can grieve him. We have all of him. He's been given to each believer. He will never leave us, just as Jesus said of himself. And even the Spirit in Acts chapter 16, verse 8 and Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, is called the Spirit of Jesus. And I love that. He is the Spirit of Jesus, and yet he is a distinct person from Jesus the Son. He is always with us, and Paul wants the Ephesians, God wants us to have a sensitivity to the Spirit. I don't want you to only think of the Christian life and sanctification as merely a list of things to do and not do. You do your devotions, you check them off, you pray, you check them off, you go to church, you check them off. I evangelized someone last week, okay. And I'm going to make sure and do these things I'm supposed to do. I'm going to avoid the things I'm not supposed to do. And that's the Christian life. I think Paul would say it's a dependence and awareness of the Spirit. It's letting him control you. And so... It begins with being aware of his presence. Do not be drunk with wine. Do not let other things dominate you, as we're going to see. Let the Spirit have his way in your life. So we discover that the great subject of sanctification in chapters 4 and 5 of Ephesians is not merely doing things and not doing things we shouldn't do. It's about walking with the Spirit of God and being with Him. So recognize His presence. Here's a second point, and it's the Spirit's control. Not only do we have the Spirit's presence in our life, He dwells within the believer. He is a person with us. He will never leave us. He has marked us for our future inheritance, but also the subject of His control, the Spirit's Control The Spirit's influence in our life, I believe, is what he means by this language of being filled. Being filled with the Spirit. Now, many years ago, I worked at a ritzy L.A. restaurant uh, late at night. And uh, as the restaurant closed and people went home, the police on a Friday or Saturday night would often have a checkpoint near uh, a group of our restaurants there. Uh, because many people would leave under the influence. Uh, I don't think any of the police met anyone under the influence of the Holy Spirit as they left the restaurant. They were under the influence of other things, nevertheless. But this is the language, actually. This is what Paul means, this idea of under the influence, that uh, placing yourself under the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. This is a, a very different kind of spirit, <laughs> As people use the word spirit today, 
a different kind of influence. But Paul is getting at the idea of influence or control. Obviously, he has a warning here about wine. Alcohol is powerful, and if abused, can be very dangerous. I've known a couple of friends that have passed away. One in particular that I spent a lot of time in Israel with uh, went to be with the Lord in his mid-20s uh, because of uh, drinking and, and, and a car wreck. Alcohol itself is not evil. Uh, just as many things in this world are not necessarily or inherently evil, it's the fallen humanity that uses it. And Paul brings up wine here. And, and this isn't a warning that Christians can never drink wine. It's a warning against drunkenness, right? Of allowing alcohol, and I think you could fill in other things here, to control you, to dominate you, for you to be under the influence of, rather than the Holy Spirit. And so he brings up the subject of wine very interestingly. He, he doesn't want to simply warn us, though, about wine. Why is he doing this? I've often thought about why would he bring up this subject. It's because he wants to connect this idea of being controlled and dominated, of something having a control over you. And he connects the idea of what wine has the potential to do with the Holy Spirit. So this is not just a prohibition of some kind. This is the idea of illustrating for you that the Christian is someone who should be characterized by being controlled, influenced, and dominated by another person, by the Holy Spirit himself. Interestingly, if you look back in Acts chapter 2, uh, if you read the early church there at the beginning, as the Spirit arrives in chapter 2, the crowds that were observing these believers, uh, they said this, they are filled with new wine. They accused them of being drunk because they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe Paul is even, maybe he has this in mind as he says this as well. Uh, they thought the early Christians were drunk. And Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 15, stands up with the 11, and he says that they are not drunk since it's only the third hour of the day. This is in the morning. Why would all of these people be drunk in the morning? The reason, the way, the way that they were, was because of the Holy Spirit. Why might they appear to be drunk? Because they were happy. They were joyful. They were at peace, enthusiastic, excited, thrilled in the Lord. By the way, does this sound like your Christian life? Are you someone characterized by joy in the Lord? Are you thrilled at the fact that there's an Ephesians chapter 2? That you were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy, decided to save you, to be gracious, to give you life, to adopt you, to choose you. Certainly nothing, uh, we had nothing to bring to the table. There was nothing that attracted us to God. He did it by his grace. But these early Christians were thrilled. They were joyful in the Lord. They were displaying what we often like to call the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. They were together as one. They were worshiping God. They were worshiping Christ together. They were telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ with excitement. It's like some of you, when you first come to faith in Christ, and you want to tell everybody you know in your life about Christ, and you start to aggravate people, right? Because you're so excited. They've got to know this. They've got to know what I know now. Man, sometimes we lose that zeal, don't we? And I love being around new believers that stoke that fire again. We need that. They were joyful, exuberant Christians. They were spirit-filled believers. No, that was not drunkenness. Why? Ephesians 5.18, because drunkenness leads to what? Dissipation, debauchery, reckless living. It actually leads to a loss of control, whereas the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control instead. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who before getting into pastoral ministry was a very successful doctor in the mid-20th century in London, he said this, Drink is not a stimulus, it is a depressant. It depresses first and foremost the highest centers of all in the brain. They are the very first to be influenced and affected by drink. They control everything 
that gives a man self-control, wisdom, understanding, discrimination, judgment, balance, the power to assess everything. He says, in other words, everything that makes a man behave at his very best and highest. He says, the better a man's control, the better man he is. A man who can control his feelings and moods and states and passions is obviously a better and a greater man than he who cannot do so. And he's right. I remember reading his biography, and as a doctor, he said, uh, most people didn't have serious issues. Most people, he just had to tell them, just live better. (laughs) Don't eat as much and don't drink as much. That seemed to be most of his counsel for his patients. And again, the Lord called him to pastoral ministry. But he's right. To be influenced, to be controlled by something else, wine does not increase one's wisdom, right? Right? or acuity, or the ability to control your body, or the ability to control your tongue. It's a powerful agent. Proverbs provides warnings for God's people when it comes to wine. Again, Scripture does not forbid the use of wine. I get this question a lot. Can Christians drink wine? The Bible doesn't forbid that. As we're going to see, there's also some positive aspects in Scripture to it. But the Scripture does warn against it. Drunkenness itself is a works of the flesh in Galatians 5.21. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 21, verse 17, Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man, and he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. So you have warnings in Scripture about the use of wine. Do not be led astray by wine. Rather, be led by the Spirit. But there are also good points about wine as well. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7, Solomon says, Go your way, eat your bread with joy, and drink wine with a merry heart, for God accepts your work. That would have been a great verse for yesterday, wouldn't it? (laughs) God accepts your work. Be happy. You did good. In Song of Songs, you have this couple in love, and it says there that the couple in love drank wine. Jesus' first miracle, the beginning of the Gospel of John, is to take water and to transform it into wine. God isn't against wine. By the way, wine is mentioned in the new earth. But having said that, what does Ephesians 5.18 tell us? Do not be drunk with it, right? Do not be controlled by wine. Rather, be controlled by the Spirit. Do not allow yourself to be dominated. And this can include any agent, any substance that would control you. Instead, Christian, be influenced. Be controlled by the person within you, the Holy Spirit. If you are filled with the Spirit, you will gain control rather than losing control. The Spirit provides the self-control needed, as well as joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, and the Christian discipline needed for the life, right? Martin Lloyd-Jones again says, the Christian is a man whose mind is expanding, whose heart is moved and enlarged, and he wants to do something. He wants to make a contribution. He wants to extend the confines of the kingdom of God. He wants others to share in it. It affects the whole of the man, intellect, emotions, and will. What a stimulus. He's right. You know, you could say it this way. The the Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit is the very best version of themselves. The, The best at thinking, at making decisions, at being disciplined and directed the right way, of having a full, more zealous heart, having more joy and pleasure in the Christian life. Allow yourself, put yourself under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Christian. By the way, notice he says, be filled with the Spirit, meaning you have a part in this, right? Right? I like to always point this out, lest we, we go too far one direction. And I find you this week just staying home, waiting for the Spirit to do something in your life. 
I argued this earlier in chapter 4. Yes, we depend entirely on the Spirit, on God himself, but we have our part in sanctification, don't we? Be filled. That's an imperative. That's a, that is directed to the Ephesians. It's directed to you. You, are, you have the responsibility as a believer to then be filled, be controlled by the Spirit. And how does one do this? I like to always ask the question, how? You know, I want more details. Help me, Paul. Help me, Lord. Let me just mention a few things here. First of all, there is a a conscious kind of dependence upon the Spirit that we need to have. A, A purposeful kind of awareness of Him. Again, being mindful that He is within us, as He told the Corinthians, as He's told the Ephesians, Uh, that he dwells within the believer, that we are to please him and not grieve him, that he's always with us. So there's this kind of dependence and awareness on him. But I would add in another element is prayer, is praying, asking the Lord for help through the power of the Spirit to live the Christian life. Doesn't Paul himself demonstrate that in this letter? He prays in chapter 1, And he prays again in chapter 3. And then in chapter 6, at the end of the letter, he asks the Ephesians that they pray for him. Why? Because Paul depends on the Spirit. And how how do we do that? What is one way we depend upon him? We pray. We ask God for help. We ask him for strength. I mean, we pray through our service. We depend upon him. We need him. We pray, Lord, help me. Strengthen me. Enable me to do the things that you have told me to do. Help me, Lord. I feel crushed under the commands of the New Testament. I know I'm a new creation, but I need your help. And then there's the Word of God. Fill your mind with the Word of God, and the Spirit uses the Word of God in your life. We can again go to the sister book of Ephesians, which is what book? You should know by now. Colossians, right? Colossians is a, is a abbreviated version of Ephesians. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. I know some of you have seen this before, but I found it helpful many years ago to see the parallel. In Colossians 3, starting in verse 16, here we have uh, the same effects of the filling of the Spirit. Next time we'll look at what a Spirit-filled church looks like because he gives us the characteristics in Ephesians 5 of a spirit-filled church. Well, we have the very much the same ideas in Colossians 3, verses 16 through 17, the same effects. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And he says something similar in our text, Ephesians 5, 18. After telling us to be filled with the Spirit, he says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. They are essentially the same effects. But what does he tell us in Colossians 3.16 to be filled with? He doesn't mention the Spirit, does he? What does he mention there? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Here are parallel ideas. How can a man or a woman in Christ be filled with the Spirit... He provides the answer in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How are you filled with the Spirit? You take the word of God and you saturate yourself in the word of God. You let the word dwell in you. I think of the psalmist, right, in Psalm 119. He hid the word in his heart. That's the idea. Taking the word and putting it in your heart and knowing it, and meditating on it, thinking through it in your life. These are the ways by which we are controlled and influenced by the Spirit. His Word is taken into us, and He uses His Word. It is 
his words anyways, and he begins to transform you through the word. He begins to influence you through the word. He begins to change your thinking through the word. He begins to affect your desires through the word. And he gives you direction for the Christian life in the word. You could say, do not be filled or controlled by wine, but be filled with the word and the spirit will change you. So friends, recognize the spirit's presence and also recognize his control. Put yourself under his control. Third and last, let's look at the spirit's power. We're kind of where I began, the Spirit's power. Do not be drunk with wine, Paul says. Is Paul simply telling us to be sober? Is that the ultimate responsibility of the Christian? You just need to make sure and be sober this week. Why is he saying this? Paul isn't simply interested in morality. He really isn't wanting to make someone that he used to be. He doesn't just want to make a Pharisee who just does the right things externally because they're the right things. Paul isn't interested in morality or behavior modification. He's interested in the Christian living in light of the grace of God. He wants the Christian to live out the new life they have in God because of what God has done for him or her. Do you remember Ephesians 4, verse 32? I'll go back there as well. Ephesians 4.32. We have a great example of this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other as what? As God and Christ forgave you. He doesn't simply tell them, be nice. (laughs) You guys be nice this week. Be nice when you leave this morning. Be kind to each other. Be forgiving of each other. No. Why? The basis is the gospel itself. You are to forgive, why? Because you've been forgiven through Christ, right? All of his exhortations are based out of the reality and the truth of the gospel. Be kind to one another, why? Because God in Christ has been kind to you. Be tender-hearted, why? Because God the Father has been tender-hearted towards you. Forgive each other, because why? Because God through Christ has forgiven you. This is what Paul does. Grace-motivated living. Christ-like character, gospel-based Christianity. A gospel-based living means living by the Spirit. He wants them to walk by the Spirit in light of the grace of God. And it's the Spirit who's a gift from God that is the enabling power of our sanctification. He is the real power for the Christian life. We live the Christian life by the power of the Spirit. Paul has demonstrated that we not only should place ourselves under his influence, but we must realize he's the one that makes the Christian life possible. Friends, we are so needy and so dependent upon God that we not only need new life and regeneration altogether, but we need the Spirit's help to live the new life out. That's the reality. I made this point last time. We're not as strong as we think we are. We are far weaker than we think we are, but that's a really good thing. Because why? Because we have the Spirit. Because God is glorified in our weakness. We need total regeneration, and we need the Spirit of God himself to empower us in the Christian life. We need the Lord's help, and we get his help through the Spirit. He is our enabling agent by which we carry out all of these gospel-based commands. Let me close by going through them. The great apostle has urged us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. To be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, to bear with one another, to maintain the unity of the spirit, to not be carried away by false doctrine, to grow in the stature of the fullness of Christ, to speak the truth in love, to put off the old man, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, to, be, to, to put on the new man, to put away falsehood, to speak the truth with our neighbor, to be angry and yet to not sin, to give the devil no opportunity, to no longer steal but to work and to share and to give, to no longer speak in ungodly ways but to build each other up by our words, to not grieve the spirit, 
to put away anger and bitterness, to be kind, to be tender-hearted, to forgive, to love, to put away sexual immorality, to put away coarse jesting, and to put on thanksgiving, to not walk in the darkness, but to walk in the light, to expose the darkness, to look carefully how we walk, to make the best use of the time, to not be foolish, but to be wise, to understand what the will of the Lord is, and to not be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. Did you get all that? How do we do all of this? We do it by the Spirit of God. We cry to the Lord. We depend upon Him. And He enables us to do these things as a new creation in Christ. We so desperately need the Lord, don't we? He never leaves us helpless. He's the best help. He's the perfect help. He's just the help we need. He's divine help from above. He's the eternal spirit of God who originally gave us life. Help from the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Help from the spirit who has immeasurable power for the Christian. The the spirit is our ever-present help in trouble. The Spirit, who is the guarantee of our future inheritance. With the Spirit, we can do all things. With the Spirit, nothing is impossible. With the Spirit, we can do the impossible like obey God. Like put away pride. Like put on humility. Like consider others more important. Like put away being drunk with wine and be filled and controlled by him. Friends, let us recognize the gift that we have with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Live your life dependent upon him. Be under the influence. The influence of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, what a gift you've given in giving us your very Spirit. Lord Jesus, after your victory over the grave, you ascended to heaven to be at the right hand of your Father. And you gave us what you promised us, your very spirit to be with us forever. Lord, he's that great seal. He's the great promise that there's a future inheritance that awaits us. And Lord, meanwhile, while we're here on earth, we know that we need his power to share the gospel. We need his power to worship you as a church. And we need his power to live out the Christian life. Lord, would you help us to walk by the Spirit, to depend upon him, and to be filled with the Spirit for your glory. We pray in your name. Amen.